welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this wonderful webinar. I'm so excited. Today, the topic we have is 1031 exchanges with the experts. And there's a fabulous panel joining me for this webinar. It's going to be packed with value. And I think I'm a big believer in the power of a, a team whenever you're um, investing and especially in real estate investing, it's so important and critical to have a solid team. So all of the uh, panel members today would be an amazing addition to your uh, team for sure. So I just wanna mention too, and I'm gonna introduce them in just a moment. Um, we are, you know, our goal for today is to make sure we answer all your questions regarding 1031 exchanges. So feel free to ask us anything. We are happy to make this interactive as possible. Um, if you have a question, just um, put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and we'll ask you to um, unmute yourself at an appropriate moment. But yeah, we definitely want to make sure that either during the presentation or at the end, we get to everything that you need to know. Um, just so you know, some of the things that we will be covering um, during the presentation are these questions. Uh, what are the important numbers to crunch to uh, make my decision? And what other real estate investing opportunities are there that maybe I haven't considered? And if I do decide to do a 1031, how do I need to prepare? And what pitfalls should I be looking out for? So we'll cover all of that and more. So now to introduce our panel. So if you don't know me yet, I'm Carrie Gatto. I'm a real estate agent and I'm with Keller Williams Realty in the Cambridge Somerville office. And I have a team called Big Picture Realty. And also today we have Michael Gear, who is a CPA with Peter J. Gilman, PC. We have Lynn Bagby, who is a 1031 intermediary, and she's with Asset Preservation Incorporated. And then we have two Delaware State Trust Specialists, Wolfgang Cease and Keegan De Silva from Great Point Capital. So thanks everyone, all our experts for being here today. I really appreciate your time. So I'll just get us started. Um, again, I'm Carrie Gatto and I have 11 years experience in as a realtor in the greater Boston area. Um, I have a focus on investment minded real estate. So I work with all kinds of clients, but I really believe in the power of real estate to build a um, financial foundation and financial freedom and security. And so whether I'm working with a first time buyer or someone who's offloading an investment property, I kind of help them see the bigger picture and how they can build wealth and a legacy with real estate. Um, I have over the years specialized um, mostly on listings. So about 70% of my business is from listings, working with sellers. And with that, I've um, become an expert in marketing and negotiation because, of course, marketing is what gets a seller the most exposure for their listing and negotiation is the way that I protect my seller's bottom line and their profit. And I, like I said, you know, I'm an investor myself. I love working with other investors. I wrote a book about investing in real estate called You Can Have It All in Real Estate. I regularly do webinars around different aspects of real estate investing. And so what we're talking about today are 1031 like-kind tax-deferred exchanges. And I'm not going to get into all the details, but just in case you're not too familiar yet, I'll just hit a couple of the points. So this is a, a great tool for reinvesting all or part of the proceeds of a sale of um, investment property. There's a time frame that you have to abide by. It's 45 days to identify the new property and 180 days to close on said property. And you can defer the capital gains uh, tax from the sale of, um, until you sell the, the next property or indefinitely, because you can keep doing this indefinitely. But like I said, we'll hear more about that later. 
this is just a, um, a market report comparing, uh, it's a year over year report for multifamilies in Massachusetts. And these numbers are year to date. So obviously um, we're early in the year, it's only mid-February, um, but this is just kind of to take the pulse of what's going on right now in the market. And if you remember this time last year, we were kind of at the height of the pandemic, right? So um, it was a time when not many people were yet vaccinated and kids were out of school. There was a lot of restrictions. It was, it was low inventory at that time for all those reasons. The listings um, that are available right now are, I think it was 17% less than this time last year. So yeah, like 17.5% less than this time last year. And similarly, the listings under agreement are about 13 or 14% less year to date than this time last year. So, I mean, that's, that's fairly significant. Um, and also the sale prices are up 13% from this time last year. Uh, we have less than a one month supply of inventory, which is, it means it's an extreme seller's market because anything less than six months is considered a seller's market. So. This means that if no new inventory came on the market as of right now, it would take less than a month for everything to sell, to be absorbed by the market. Average is around two months, which is actually pretty low. And if it's priced well, most properties are selling in much less than that, like a week or two. Okay, so all of this to say that basically what's going on is it goes back to supply and demand um, economics 101 um, inventory is historically low demand is high due to interest rates being still historically low therefore prices are the highest ever that they've ever been so it's a great seller's market and yet these dynamics won't last um, the market always shifts it always adjusts and balances so um you know, we definitely predict that in the spring, there'll be an onslaught of um, if of new inventory coming on. There always is in the spring, the only exception being 2020 when COVID first started, and then it just got pushed to the summer. But this spring, especially because of the fact that there's a pent up demand of sellers who were waiting for COVID to you know, get better and now restrictions are being lifted and pe most people are vaccinated so we're expecting there will be a, a lot more inventory coming on in the next month which is good if you're doing a 1031 it means you can kind of lock in a high price for your existing property and then have um, more choices as you are looking for a new property the other factor here is the interest rates they ticked up last december and they're expected to go up again in march so um, buyers are very eager to lock something in at the existing rates before they increase. They're not supposed to increase significantly or you know, a lot dramatically, but um, even a small increase at high price points makes a dramatic difference over a 30 year loan. So there's definitely um, something to consider there. So does it make sense to sell now? Well, these are the questions that I would recommend you ask yourself. Do you have a lot of equity that could be redeployed or leveraged? And most people do if they've owned property for more than a few years, because we've seen double digit appreciation over the past couple years. Um, so unless you've refinanced or, um, you know, pulled equity out, you probably do. And would it make sense to roll into a higher priced property while the rates are low? You know, if you're going to use financing to upgrade your portfolio and buy a higher priced property, maybe it does make sense to do that while interest rates are still low. Have you thought about perhaps investing out of state for better returns on your investment? There are lots of opportunities, you know, new communities coming out in different areas of the country that you know, now that people can work remotely and things like that, 
that are looking really good investment wise. So that might be something to think about. Or have you thought about investing in commercial real estate? And you can do, I checked with Lynn and you can do a uh, 1031 into commercial real estate. And there are definitely some opportunities there, like maybe in the cities where um, prices have really taken a hit, but they'll likely come back to some extent. Or do you just want to retire and, you know, not be a landlord anymore and have a more passive income? And there's a way to do that with a 1031 and Wolfgang and Keegan are going to talk more on that in a little bit. And this is a slide I just wanted to show real quick because a lot of multifamily owners will, you know, if they're considering selling, they'll ask me about condo conversion as an option to see if they can make more money that way. Most of the time, if it's a, you know, a new developer, you know, someone who hasn't done it before, I would say now is probably not the best time to do your condo conversion. And I say that for these reasons. Right now, um, there's a high, higher cost than usual for renovation. There's supply chain backups and labor and materials cost more than they did before COVID, a lot more. Um, and sometimes because of permitting, depending on which town or city you're in, the condo conversion can take one to two years or more. In Somerville, sometimes it can take up to seven years because of the restrictions they have there. And also the market for condos has, you know, been a little precarious since COVID started because more first time buyers are actually trying to get into single family homes. And they maybe don't want to be in urban areas as much. So if you still want to look at condo conversion, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, and you know, walk you through. I've helped other people do it before, but in general, that would kind of be my my take on it for right now. So, if you're thinking of potentially selling or potentially doing a 1031, I would say first step is to get an updated market analysis, so you know what your property's worth in today's market. Um, like I said, there's been double-digit appreciation over the past year, even. <laughs> And definitely over the past two, three, four, or five years. So it's good to know what your property is worth, you know. Um, and don't trust Zillow or Redfin or any of those stuff because they have not been in your property and they don't know what upgrades you might have done. They don't know the intricacies of the neighborhood and how one street over from another can be a lot different. You really want an appraiser or a realtor to give you your your market analysis. Um, and of course, an appraiser will charge you a fee, usually a realtor will do it complimentary. Um, and a couple things about if you do work with a realtor, for one thing, um, they can even just give you a ballpark, which could be helpful without having to set foot into the home, because I know a lot of times people don't want to upset the tenants, you know, they don't want to upset the status quo. Um, so if you have pictures from like a recent rental listing maybe or you know um or can really just describe the property itself you can get a good ballpark but make sure you get a a full cma in writing you don't want just like an off the cuff number i think it's important to understand where the number came from so i'll always include you know a detailed summary of the, the comparables and how I'm comparing them to your property and the full analysis so you know for yourself where I got that number. And then also a realtor might be able to give you tips to maximize your sale price, such as thinking about how leases or the lack thereof could factor into the sale um, or maybe upgrades that you should or shouldn't do in order to get your best price and the most profit. So yeah, next step, steps. Um, so schedule a market analysis, understand the tax implications, talk to your CPA, talk to Michael, who's on the call today, and make sure you know what's gonna happen regarding taxes. And then, you know, just think about your goals and you can make a well-informed decision from there. You know, is this a good time for you to go forward? All right, so that's it for me, but um, if you have specific questions or want a market analysis or want to chat, that's my email and phone number. Definitely feel free to, to reach out. 
and I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Thank you very much, Carrie. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as um, Carrie said, my name is Michael Gear. I'm a CPA. I've been here, uh, I've been in public accounting for 18 years now, so that's close to 20 years. And uh, I help you know, my clients uh, with their tax planning and their compliance needs as well in their individual aspects and their businesses. And uh, over the past 10 years, I, you know, as, the more real estate you do, the more likely you are to see 1031. So I'm going to share my screen. And the most important thing is that you want to make sure that you wind up with us, that, that when you have a 1031, have a CPA. In the year that you have a 1031 exchange, have a CPA prepare your tax return. Uh, don't try to prepare it yourself. Don't try to bring it to H&R Block. Um, you know, enrolled agents, there, there, there are enrolled agents that do great work, great tax work. Um, but the, the real big difference is that um, CPAs are more, much more likely to have, a, not all of them, but we're more, much more likely to have a stronger accounting background. That comes into play when you have a 1031. So just basically, you have a like-kind exchange of the property during the year. You're going to report it on uh, Form 8824. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's not that complicated of a form. You list all the dates in the, uh, in, in the transaction. And then, um, you know, you put in your original cost basis, your deferred gain amount, and how much you're buying the new property for. There's really not that much to fill out, but it's the work that goes into it. Um, you know, reading the settlement slash HUD statement, um, but, you know, with, with and viewing where the, having to review all the funds that go in and out of the qualified intermediaries account, um, just being, translating that and putting it into accounting form and putting it on the tax return, that takes some time. So 8824 though, it's pretty simple. You're not reporting the gain on your tax return. You're filing this form 8824. And when um, you've done the transaction, you, don't, you file it with your income tax return. So if you're a Schedule E taxpayer and you've got a couple of rental properties and you've exchanged one of them, you're gonna, and you did the exchange in 2021, you're gonna report it on your 2021 1040. If it's a trust, it's 1041. Partnership 1065, S Corporation 1120S. And uh, I mean, I don't think, uh, you know, any people on the call, if they have properties here, they have them in corporations. Um, and, and um, you know, again, the CPA, uh, you know, tend to have a, uh, you know, just a strong accounting background. You definitely, you're not all CPAs are the same. You definitely want to make sure that if you're looking for a CPA to prepare you, should ask them, hey, you know, do you, have you, are, do you have a lot of real estate clients? If they say, yeah, I got one or two, maybe stay away from that. Um, there's also, uh, and it, it, a lot of CPAs do assurance work and attestation work. So they're, you know, preparing financial, they're auditing financial statements for their clients, reviewing financial statements for their clients that are issued to the bank. Not, it's more than just debits and credits and QuickBooks and bookkeeping. Uh, so CPAs that do that to pass the exam and, and practicing, um, get building their accounting career. That's what you generally, a lot of them need to do that. So as Carrie um, mentioned before, yes, you can do a, a residential property for a commercial property. That's right. Um, the IRS, the, the, the rules here are liberal. It, it can be it's real property, which is real estate, and it's defined as land and generally anything built or attached to it. And it's beyond even uh, residential. You know, if you have a multifamily investment property and you feel like you want to go into uh, the retail or office space and going into commercial, um, it's beyond that. You can do, um, you know, apartment, an office building. You can sell towers. If, classified as real property, hotels, 
warehouses, storage facilities. Storage facilities got up in the pandemic. I don't know where they are now. Um, and even undeveloped land. Um, if you have undeveloped land that, that you know there's a rental and there's some sort of business activity on it, and you feel like uh, getting uh, into some uh, rental real estate, multifamily, then you can you can use the undeveloped land in the uh, 1031 like kind exchange transaction. And the rest of these slides are just um, going through, um, you know, different tax matters. Um, is care, you know, there's the 45 day rule to identify, and there is a 180 day to complete the acquisition of the new property. You also have a, a reverse exchange. I'm sure Lynn will get into that more. Um, that's the opposite where you actually acquire a property first and then you sell your investment property or one of your investment properties. And it's the same time frame, 45 days to identify your sold property, and then 180 days actually go through with selling your um, sold property. And just keep in mind, it, it, you know, sometimes I had a client uh, last year that was uh, that sold um, a residential condo, and he, he contacted me and said, "Hey, what's what's the gain going to be on this?" And the tax it was about 10 grand, and at the end of the day, it wasn't it wasn't that much. It wasn't that big of a deal, so it didn't do a uh, like kind of exchange. It was too much to go through, and you know it is a compli more complicated transaction than uh, just selling the property. But what I'm getting at here is the more that it appreciates, the more of an unrealized gain that you have in your property that you're looking to get rid of, then the more it makes sense um, for tax purposes. Um, to do a uh, like kind exchange and defer the gain and not have to pay any tax. Um, keep in mind, two years. That's that's the that's key, and it's got to be it's got to be business property, so an investment property, something you're renting. It's it's not your home. So if you have um, if you bought something and after two years and, and you rented it out, and after two years you feel like, you know what? I'm going I want to exchange this for I want to I want to invest in something bigger. Then um, that's when you can do the 1031. And it's not you're not going to find that in the Internal Revenue Code. It's based on an IRS court case that a judge ruled on, and he threw out the two year um, rule. And uh, he mentioned two years as like a hypothetical length of time. Uh, so that's why everybody follows the two years and the 1031. And just keep in mind, so if you're if you have a mass apartment or a condo that you're renting out and you want to go into a different state, let's say it's New Hampshire, so and you do a 1031 exchange for that new asset in New Hampshire, so the at the federal level that's going to be recon, that's going to be recognized as a deferral. So you won't owe you'll file um, the 8824 and you won't have to yeah, pay federal tax on that. Yep, no problem. But then you, but if you, um, but at the mass level, it, if you do that exchange, because it's a, not the same, because he asked new assets, not in the same state as mass, you will need, you, you will owe tax for mass. Mass won't recognize the deferral. Another thing to think about is cash. If you had a million dollar property and with somebody and you did a direct exchange, and they gave you a $900,000 property and they said, hey, I'll give you $100,000. That $100,000 in cash, also known as boot, that would be taxable as the gain. So you'd have a partial deferral of gain on that. And just to keep in mind that when, you have, when you're looking for 100% deferral, the property you're acquiring must be equal to or higher than the property you're exchanging. Um, if you so if you have if you buy a if you sell your property but then you buy a property and it's worth less but and it needs substantial improvements those um, substantial those improvements will get you and using everything that the bank gave you uh, from the mortgage and putting it into the property that will that will help you qualify for the full 100% uh, deferral again just again watch out for boot. If your if your improvement costs fell a little short, you're able to save a certain amount of money. You wouldn't want to just distribute the remaining money 
to yourself. Um, there's extra rules that you'd need to follow there. It gets somewhat more complicated. Um, and just keep in mind, let's say you, you, ident you, you sell your property, you, you, you set up the 1031, you sell your property on 1231, uh, 2021, and uh, you, you, got the idea, you got to do the rest of the transaction. That's okay. You can straddle a year, it's, but it's more likely that your return is going to go on extension uh, if you do a uh, like-kind exchange. And I'm not going to go too far into this because I want to keep things going. These, you know, I mentioned the drop and swap here with, you know, if you have a partnership and you want to, um, some part, one partner wants to do the 1031 and the other partners want to sell out. There's that. Um, keep in mind, real briefly, if you're in a partnership, if, if it's going to be the partnership that's going to purchase the new building, that partnership needs to stay alive as an entity. So it's important if you have other people leaving, if you, it, instead of doing a drop and swap, you got to get somebody else in to keep the partnership alive in order to get some sort of 1031 going there. And just if, if this is very important. People think, people have in their mind, oh, I just did a 1031. I never have to worry about that capital gain because um, I'm, I'm never going to pay it. Well, that would be true if you hold on to that building through the rest of your life, you pass away, then the current law, that's going to get stepped up in basis. That's okay. But keep in mind, if you go into a new property and then after a few, if that's more, and there was a highly, and there's high appreciation on that. And you decided to sell that new property. The basis, the cost you're using is, is what, what that basis was of that original asset plus any improvements you could have a really high gain selling um, that you know, property if you wanted to get out of the real estate business. So that's what I have. I'll just flash my first slide. That's my phone number. That's my email. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Carrie. Thank you for having me today. Thanks so much, Michael. So now we're going to hear from Lynn Bagby. Okay, I'm going to hit share screen. Let's see. Okay, where are we here? Let's see, where's Carrie? There we go. I think this is the right one. Can you see? Can everybody see my slides? Yep. Okay, yeah, wonderful. Perfect. Now let's see if they move. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about 1031 exchanges. And how come they're, I don't know what's happening here. It took us a few minutes the last time to get it going. I am, I am screen sharing. Mm. Well, you know what? I'm gonna have to just, I don't know what I'm gonna do because it was working when we began, but it's not working now. I could let see me your stop, screen. Let me stop, the, huh? but it's not, then, it's not letting me advance. Let me just stop the share and start it again. Let's see if this works. Sometimes when you hit escape, it, it will reset it also. All right, start. let me try that. Thank you. I'm not a computer expert. <laughs> I am a 1031 expert, but not a computer expert. <laughs> Okay, let's see if this works. All right, so we're going to talk about the power of 1031 exchange. You know what, I'm just going to dive in. Actually, and Michael, thank you for that presentation. And Carrie, thank you for yours, because 1031 exchange is a tax election on the real estate transaction. The keywords are that that property that you're selling needs to have been investment property, that the taxpayer is held on for enough time to qualify it as investment. So as Michael addressed, that there is a general two-year rule um, that is because there's only two sections of the tax code that actually dictate a whole holding period. One's in the related party section for related parties doing exchanges or swapping properties where there is a two year hold. And then in qualifying vacation home guidance where there's a 24 month hold, which could go into three taxable years. So there are more factors than just holding. So if you have property now that you've had for say under 12 months, it would probably be like driving on the freeway 
the wrong way. You better have a darn good reason when the cop comes to give you the ticket. All right. So not saying you can't, it's all about intent. There's a lot of different factors involved. The other thing is that um, Michael addressed absolutely correct. This is tax planning. I find that many clients, I've been in this business industry for 21 years and as a certified exchange specialist. So I've, uh, I work for Asset Preservation Inc. We're a 33 year old QI firm. It's all we do all day. We're not in court. We're not doing anything else. We're dedicated to that. We're owned by Stewart Title and Guarantee, which is a 127 year old national title insurance company. So we're well backed, we're felt well financed and very experienced at what we do. We do work with all types of exchange formats, delayed, reverse and improvement exchanges. And I'm only really gonna talk about the delayed today. So again, going back to you know holding and what makes a property qualify, it's not just the amount of time you've held the property, there's other factors involved. So this tax code, one of the slides that you're not seeing, and I will follow up, Carrie's gonna give me, um, the names of everybody that signed up today, I will go to PDF these slides and send them to you as well as, long, as well of some other um, interesting material like that talks about the, uh, the stages, the introduction to the delayed exchange requirements for full deferral, You're gonna get a whole bunch of stuff. So that said, you can just grab, take a notepad and, and write a few notes. So this is a tax planning tax code. You, you probably don't wanna be cavalier about it because you don't wanna pay your taxes. Taxpayers that own investment property, when they see their capital gains tax hit, especially now, don't want to pay those taxes. So this is a legal way to avoid them. But if you're just wanting to avoid them on the first go round, guaranteed, the next time you're going to end up paying them. So really think seriously about it. It's not a DIY project. Think about your long-term goal in real estate investing. Every good investment portfolio has some real estate in it. And if you're the type of person that wants to be a landlord, or you don't want to be a landlord, Wolf's going to address some properties that are passive income producing properties that you don't have to manage properties. And some people do a combination of both. So section 1031 is described as a property held, I'm going to put it in layman's terms, but property held for productive use in trade or business when it's exchanged solely for other property that's been held for, pro going to be held for uh, productive use in trade or business or for investment. Um, and you can defer that you don't have to uh, recognize the, um, the game. And so basically what's happening is you start out purchasing a property at a certain basis, which the, the tax cost basis follows you throughout your exchange history. So if you do cash out, you will pay taxes back to the beginning. But again, good tax planning will help you to continue to stay invested in real estate as your life changes, your goal changes, you want to relocate, go to different areas, different property types, because you can exchange any kind of investment real estate for any kind of investment real estate. The key being you're going to hold that property for productive use in trade or business or for investment, meaning like a chunk of dirt. So some of the other interesting types, which is written on the slide, I was listening and smiling when Michael was talking and Carrie was talking about cell phone tower easements and things like that, depending on if you're in a city. Air rights are also exchangeable. If you own the building underneath and you want to sell the airspace on the top, you're more than welcome to do that and go buy an apartment building if you want to. Um, and you can cross state lines. Some other types are um, leasehold interests of 30 years or more. It does include the options. The DST types of properties that Wolf and Keegan are going to talk about that are passive income streams. These are institutional grade properties for the most part. Um, and you basically are going to sit back, no property management, and you can collect a check. When is a good time to get involved in a 1031 exchange? Well, when you're thinking about, if you have investment property and you're thinking about selling it, you want to talk to Carrie as far as listing your property, get that current market analysis and anything else you need to see if this would be a good time for you to sell. Then you'd want to visit a CPA like Michael to be able to see what your tax hit's going to be if you just outright sell the property and you don't exchange. Michael's right. If you've just got maybe a five or 10, $15,000 gain or so, maybe you don't want to exchange, but where's your ouch factor? How much in taxes do you not want to pay? Because there are four taxes that are paid on a 1031 exchange. The first is the depreciation recapture tax. Residential real estate depreciates at 27.5 years, commercial at 39. That includes the building because land's not, not depreciable, but the building and the capital improvements you've made. Capital improvements are able to be depreciated and what they are not 
is paint, wallpaper, repairs, and maintenance. Those would be business expenses. So um, you would take that into consideration. Um, so the depreciation recapture at 25%, the federal capital gain at either 15 or 20, the net investment income tax, which is part of the Affordable Care Act and part of um, uh, uh, is on passive income, which would include the capital gain from your sale and then state capital gains tax as applicable. If you're here in Massachusetts, our state capital gains tax is somewhere between 5.1 and 5.2. New Hampshire doesn't have one, but they may have a business tax, but that does not apply for tax, um, go for tax deferral. Maine is at six. Vermont is who knows. They've got a sliding scale. And I believe Rhode Island is up to about 6% based on income. So depending on where you're investing, gives you some kind of an idea. So these tax, uh, these tax bills might be pretty hefty. Now, Carrie mentioned at the beginning in her slide that you can have a full deferral or a partial deferral, and that's where Michael is going to come in. One of the figures you need to know is that tax cost basis on the property, which is how much you bought it for, plus capital improvements minus depreciation. That's the tax platform from which your capital gain is calculated. So the gain is between that number and your sales price of the property minus your allowable costs of sale, which are real estate commission, tax stamps and recording fee fee for legal counsel, if any, and the qualified intermediary fee. That's where your gain is. And that's what gets taxed at at least a, a property that's sold in Massachusetts at those, probably those four tax rates, um, depending on if the NIIT tax applies. So, um, so that said, if you're buying equal or greater than the net sales price of your property, you're able to buy other replacement property to satisfy that number. You can identify and purchase more than one. And so that said, if you reach that net sales price, all cash goes into the transaction. Any difference is made up with new mortgage money or, or outside cash, then you'll have a full deferral. But let's just say you don't wanna reinvest at that amount. You need to reinvest at a figure somewhere between that tax cost or depreciated basis and the net sales price. You need to be investing enough over that tax cost basis in order to have gain to defer. Reinvesting at or below that tax cost basis does not allow a partial exchange at all. It's not that simple. Again, not a DIY. You're going to consult with someone like Michael, okay, to find out what those numbers are. Um, and then maybe you have a conversation about, well, looking at the rest of my tax pack, uh, tax picture, how much should I spend? How much should I reinvest? Now, this is where DSTs like what Wolf and Keegan are going to talk about come in. Sometimes you'll have a property. Let's just say, for example, you have a net sales price on a property. Let's just say it's in Cambridge in Carrie's world, <laughs> but you sell for a million sixty-five thousand dollars, and we're going to assume that sixty-five thousand dollars represents your allowable cost of sale. And so you and your tax cost basis in the property is four hundred thousand, and you find a property for eight hundred thousand. Well, you still have two hundred thousand sitting on the table. That's where going into a DST, because right around here, you're not gonna really find something for 200 unless you go to a less expensive area, but you really don't wanna manage a property out of state. So that's where going to someone like Wolf and Keegan to buy maybe a DST property could be helpful for you because that will allow you to use up the, um, the, the, the unreinvested gain to defer all your capital gains taxes. So that's are just some thoughts about how you can combine properties. When do you pull people in to start working on your exchange? Again, you're going to start with Carrie to list your property, get at your market analysis. You're going to consult with Michael to see if a 1031 exchange makes sense. And simultaneously, you're calling a qualified intermediary like myself to be able to talk you through the process and answer your questions. One of the things a qualified intermediary does or they should be doing, side note, this is a non-regulated industry. There are no rules and 1031 exchange accommodators, qualified intermediaries, except for maybe six states, okay? So you have people that practice as a QI that maybe it's a side business, they're dabbling in it, or it's part of what they do. So you, and you wanna work with one who's going to take the time to explain the guidelines to you. Please note, like Carrie and like Wolf and Keegan, we are not permitted to provide tax or legal advice. So we cannot, we cannot advise you on whether you should or should not do an exchange. Um, most times, I in some of the difficult situations, like drop and swap, Michael, I am talking to a client who may want to get out of the tax reporting entity they're using and make changes 
and some changes can be made and some can't. So um, the fact is, I may say, well, I can't advise on that. Here's some information. And I want you to ask the CPA this specific question. So I'm able to take you to a water fountain, but I can't turn the knob on for you. So, but we have 150 pieces of printed material that talk about everything under the sun when it comes to 1031 exchanges. So with that information, you're able to go ask your accountant an intelligent question to determine what is right for you because tax, tax is very complicated. And so um, you'll talk to the qualified intermediary. We'll get the tax reporting history of this property, how you use the property, how long you've held it, who's the taxpayer. If you're in a business entity or a trust, sometimes the trust or the business entity is the actual taxpayer. Sometimes those entities are disregarded to an individual. Just remember at the end of the day, the tax ownership for a period of time before a sale through the exchange and for a period of time after must remain the same. We also have issues, and especially if you are a married couple, sometimes I'll have one of the spouses bought a property in college, and now they want to sell it, and they want to add their spouse to the deed on the new property. If you're buying at that same value or less for a partial exchange, a non-community uh, non property state, legally married spouses are viewed as individual tax owners, and therefore... The spouse on the deed is the spouse on the new deed to the next property. They're the exchanger. You can think about adding that additional spouse at a later date, but not right away. Um, so that's why if you actually have a residential rental and you're going into commercial and you want to form an LLC, for example, and add your spouse, you're not able to do that. Even if both spouses individually own married filing jointly on the original property, you're not able to enter into a two-person LLC right away, even though you're married, it's regarded for tax purposes and the tax ownership changes. And Michael alluded to that as well. So this is where tax planning is important. I know I'm getting into a lot of details and I'm gonna get out of those now, but I want you to see it's not a DIY. So um, let's talk about the timeline. So you've engaged Carrie, you've talked to Michael, you've talked to the QI, now it's time to set up an exchange. Everything looks good. The qualified intermediary is going to request from your legal counsel a copy of the purchase and sale contract prior to the sale, copy of the current or copy of the uh, purchase and sale contract, copy of the current deed prior to sale. We're going to request uh, the closing attorney's information and um, how the buyer is going to take title and if anybody in the office is going to want to get copied. Our role is to produce documents to make this transaction into a 1031 exchange and take control of your funds at closing. The reason for this is, is what's mixed in with all that money? The government's tax dollars. They got to keep an eye on them. And it's got to be a non-related third party, which is the role that the QI has. That's why the fiduciary responsibility and integrity of the company is so important since it's not regulated. Okay. So our role is to produce those documents. When you go to identify replacement property from the date you close the sale, you've got 180 calendar days to actually close on replacement property that you've identified by day 45. So the 180 is inclusive of those first 45 days. Sometimes when you're seeing it writing, you think it's 45 plus 180. It's not. It's 180, 45 is the first 45 days. That includes weekends and holidays, it's calendar days. Upon receipt of funds, the QI issues you um, the acknowledgement that they received your money, the identification notice and the identification rules. So how do you properly identify? And when do I identify? Let's just stop and let's just say you're gonna close your relinquished property sale, the property you're selling on March 1st. Well, guess what? If you were selling a house and buying a house, are you waiting till your house sells to go look for another house? No, you're not. You're, you've contacted Carrie. She's, she's the one that listed and sold your property. She's helping you find something else. Or maybe you're engaged talking to Wolf and Keegan too. But at any rate, you're talking about what you want to buy and looking even before your property sells. Now, let me tell you about some real world experience. Based on the market we've been going through, um, everything's a mess. It's been so, and there have been deals that have fallen apart because there's been bidding wars. And sometimes the person with the winning, winning bid didn't end up qualifying for the mortgage and the deal fell apart. So before you start negotiating on contracts, depending on market conditions prior to the sale, you want to make sure that your buyer can't fall away for any reason, short of death, 
but like that there that there's a bad title report they they um there's a bad inspection that the um appraisal doesn't come in right if they can walk away you might get stuck if you've already entered into a contract so when you feel confident that your buyer is not going to walk out you're able to make deposits and negotiate on replacement property even before your sale closes. Just make sure that it's going to close after your sale. So what happens then is the QI prepares the documents for your 1031 exchange. You sign them prior to the closing of the sale, even if it's the same day, they take in the money. Then when you go to identify, ideally you're coming into that 45 day period and on the ID notice that the QI sent you, you're gonna list the property or properties you intend to buy. There's three different property rules to use. The three property rule allows you to identify up to three properties of any value with the intention to buy one, two or all three because what's your goal to defer all capital gains taxes to hit that net sales price or greater, okay? The 200% rule allows you to identify four or more, but they can't be more than two times your contract price. So if you sell for 500,000, um, that's your sales price, not net sales price, sales price, two times five is a million dollars. You're able to identify four or more properties, but they can't exceed a million dollars. That's two times your sales price. Now you don't have to ID properties valued up to a million dollars. You could come in at 800,000, but because you've identified four or more, you have to use that next rule. The 95, and um, I know Wolf and Key can do these a lot with DST properties because many times there's portfolios that have multiple properties. And when you're doing DST, you've got to identify by the amount, the number of properties. Um, the offerings are different when you're getting a fee assessed by the QI, but it's actually the amount of properties in the portfolios if they're multiple property portfolios. Um, and then the last rule is the 95% rule. So you can identify four or more, but if the total of the values of those properties go over two times your sales price, like say over the million dollars, even to a million and one, so double, triple check your math, right? Um, then you have to be able to buy 95% of all those properties. If one property falls out, most times it, the, it, the deal's done, it's dead because it's more than three properties and it exceeds 200%. So they don't give you partial credit. Last thing I wanna talk about. Oh, and then let's say, on the backside, the QI will wire out your funds for the purchase closing, um, and there's exchange docs that go with that. So um, again, when you see the slide deck, I've got a whole diagram of how it works. Um, and you can always give me a call. My numbers are gonna be on that after the fact. Call me up, and I'm glad to have a conversation. Lastly, and then I think it's a time for me to get off. Somebody give a flag because I was so busy with this, I didn't look at the time. Multifamily yeah, properties. Running. Pardon me? <laughs> We are running short on time. <laughs> okay, all right. So let me make it real quick, Carrie, because this one's important. Suppose you live in an owner-occupied multifamily. Michael, this is where we need you. Um, owner-occupied multi. And say it's a three unit. And say you live on the first floor, two floors two and three are rented. Let's just say, for example, it's a $950,000 sale. Take away the $50,000 for allowable costs. Let's just say all three units are the same size. Um, which based on square footage, Michael's decided that you live in a third of the property and the other two thirds is investment. You can do an exchange for $600,000 into other investment properties under section 1031. And then you can take, uh, exclude the capital gain on the value of, of the um, capital gain of the primary residence up to $250,000 as a single filer, 500,000 married filing jointly. That is called a split treatment transaction. So if there's mortgage value on the property, it needs to be allocated. You can't take the remainder of those, uh, the cash on the table, all in cash for your primary value and stick the home mortgage on the investment side. You'd have to allocate that accordingly as well. So that said, thank you everybody for your time. And I'm gonna hand it over to Wolf, I think is next, right? Yep. Wolf I'll put my information in the chat box. I actually put it there already. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Lynn is a wealth of information. She's so responsive really to questions. So she's a great person having your corner. Perfect. And I'll just I'll just uh, get us started here on the DST side. Um, thanks again, everyone, for the time. And I'll keep this short. Um, so yeah, Wolf and I work at Great Point Capital. My role over there is running due diligence on all DST assets. Uh, so as was touched on earlier, the DST really is a passive investment institutional grade assets. And so when we look at due diligence, we pride ourselves not only on looking at the asset, but understanding 
the change in lifestyle that is occurring. A, a large value add here is you, you're tired of having tenants. You want your passive checks coming in. So we want to make sure that the investor relations department, the operations department, everything is, is going to make that experience as good as possible for you beyond just obviously getting your check every month and some appreciation in the assets. Uh, so we are a boutique wealth management firm uh, founded in 2000. Uh, we specialize in tax deferral strategies. So in, in this conversation, we'll talk about 1031s, but we also do opportunity zones as well. Um, and I work here with Wolfgang specifically on his 1031 opportunity zone practice. And um, again, I'll let him get into the actual product. Uh, but again, you can reach out to us with any questions on the DSTs. Definitely. Thanks, Keegan. And thanks, Kerry, for putting this together. And, you know, one thing I'd like to stress at the beginning of this, uh, of our talk here is that having a good team in place when making a, a major financial decision, like selling a property, an investment property, and uh, doing a 1031, you need to, you need a good team in place. And everybody on this call is very highly regarded in the industry. And if I was doing an exchange, I would work with everybody on this call as well. So anyway, having a good team in place is, is imperative so that you don't end up with a taxable liability. Who am I? Wolfgang Cease. I manage our New England operations out of Beacon Hill. The majority of our clients, Keegan and I's clients, are high net worth real estate investors. We call ourselves a brick and mortar financial advisors. Um, I'm an expert in 1031 exchanges, specifically Delaware Statutory Trust, uh, custom tick uh, exchanges, as well as Opportunity Zone Investments. I am I am personally a landlord myself, as well as a real estate inv investor, both uh, passively and actively. I've done 1031s myself as well. Um, real quick, uh, in terms of Lens already talked about what a 1031 exchange is and the rules, so I'm not going to go through that. But Delaware Statutory Trust. So 1031s have been around for 101 years. So, you know, Michael, most CPAs are very well versed in the 1031 process. Delaware Statutory Trust have actually only been around since 04. And they've really, in the last few years, gained traction in the industry. And I'll just give you a quick example. In 2010, there was roughly $200 million worth of DST business done industry-wide. In 2020, that number jumped to 3.7 billion. And last year, industry-wide, we did close to $7.4 billion in securitized 1031 transactions. I'd also like to stress, um, if Kerry's selling your, your investment property for a million, and, and Lynn gave this example, and you and she finds you something for eight hundred thousand dollars to exchange into. We can handle that boot, so you don't get taxed on that extra two hundred thousand dollars. And we do this all the time. And it's it's it it's one of the greatest things about DSTs is the certainty of closing. You there's no haggling over price. If you call us up and say I need one hundred sixty seven thousand dollars in one of the three deals, one of the three offerings you send us over to you, we'll call and secure that equity and we can be closed within a couple of days. So we do boot all the time. We do the full exchange quite often as well. And what happens a lot, I, I'll give one more quick example here. If Kerry sells, sells your place for a million and finds you a perfect place for a million, what we're seeing in today's market is that in 45 days, it's hard to get all of the due diligence done on the property that you're purchasing. And let's say it, it rolls into day 46, you're, the seller of the property you're exchanging into knows that, that you, you have no more negotiating power. They know that if you want to do the exchange, this is what you have to do. So Keegan and I routinely implore people to use us as a backup. And we can go into case study after case study where somebody calls us on day 63 and says, hey, I ID one of your DSTs and my deal fell through. And in fact, recently we had somebody that was using the 200% rule and I ID five assets, one of them being our DST. 
They want it to be an active landlord. And at the end of the day, all four of those fell through. And this gentleman was in South Carolina. And at the end of the day, all four fell through. He called us up very nervous and frantic well into it, into the, after his 45 days, but before the 180 days, the 135 days that you have to execute. And we still had the equity for him and saved him a huge tax liability. He has sent, sent many, many uh, potential clients our way. And I'm sure if we were down in South Carolina, he would buy us dinner or do something because we are his favorite people. Um, anyway, I'll talk real quick about characteristics of BSTs, passive ownership. You are completely passive, no toilets, tenants, and trash. There's no management. There's no capital calls. You exchange a hundred grand into a DST. You will never get a capital call. You will never get a, a call from a tenant. You're in it. You get to benefit from the expertise of institutional ownership and management, any debt, that uh, you need to replace, as Lynn mentioned, you need to replace not only the purchase price, but also the equity and debt levels that you're exchanging out of, that uh, any debt in the DST is non-recourse, it's off your balance sheet, it's off your credit report, you can go borrow as you would without having this, this uh, liability on your balance sheet and it's non-recourse, and it, anyway, it, it, I'll go into the diversification part. You can diversi diversify both geographically and by commercial real estate sector. So you could do multifamily, cell phone towers, uh, storage lockers, portfolios of triple net assets, manufactured housing, industrial, life science. It's so you, you can, take small slivers of your exchange and spread them out both by, by uh, state, city, and also by sector. It's not a blind pull. They're not raising capital. They've already bought the asset. It's stabilized and they're just selling uh, slivers of equity ownership. And lastly, I'd like to point out, if you do exchange into a DST, you are not married to that structure. At termination, when the DST sells, sells the asset, you can either take your cash and pay taxes, you can roll it into another DST, or you can call Carrie and exchange it into another uh, investment property with her. This is just a, a hypothetical menu of DSTs on, on a uh, broker dealer's platform. I'd just like to point out that many different sectors, as I mentioned before, and many different LTVs. So we have everything from an all cash deal, all cash offerings to offerings that also, that are 87 and change LTV. So we can blend a portfolio with multiple DSTs to fit any LTV requirements for debt replacement for the IRS. Here's a DST investor profile, somebody that's owned it, owned appreciated assets, hesitant about selling due to a large tax bill, doing estate planning. DSTs are great for estate planning. They're very easily divisible. Coming up with the value of a DST upon death is very easy. It's, uh, and then it's, you know, if you have seven heirs, you get, each one gets one seventh of your interest in the DST. Somebody that's looking towards retirement, sick of being a landlord, looking for passive cash flow, escaping a local real estate market. Uh, we've, we've exchanged a lot of people out of New England and Chicago area looking to exchange into Texas, Florida, Nevada, these tax-free states. So there's been huge demand for people to escape, to lighten, to diversify out of a particular uh, higher tax state. And uh, lastly, 1031 exchange options. It's so difficult to find replacement properties right now if you're working with a smaller amount. If you're working with like $10 million, you can go find, you can go find something probably relatively easy. 
if you're working with a million dollars, it's a tough, it's a tough one out there. And that's why we implore you to uh, use us as a backup. And just in case it doesn't work out, you find the perfect property and it falls apart. And it happens, it happens a lot more than than people realize. And Keegan, am I missing anything? Because I'm trying to, I'm trying to talk. Yeah. Again, I think the, the, the big thing there being that putting it on your ID sheet is not binding in any way to you. There is no downside. Uh, obviously, if you have three properties already that you feel comfortable in and you don't want to use a 200% rule, that, that may be a reason to not do it. But beyond that, if you only have one asset that you're IDing, uh, putting the DST there is is non-recourse to you so um 100 there's no downside and we always advise it because it does uh give you a leg up in the negotiation after the 45th day and it does provide you in case an environmental uh thing went wrong or anything like that you you do pre prevent yourself from a taxable event so uh i think that's the biggest thing is it's just giving yourself an option in case something goes wrong great um this is just a hypothetical uh case study that I'll go through rather quickly. This is a married couple, 71 years old. They had a health scare. Um, they've got a child in their 50s that has absolutely no interest in getting involved in the family's real estate business. They also have a grandchild in college. They've amassed a nice $100 million portfolio over the years. They've developed and managed these assets themselves. And they've received a great offer on one of their properties. So that offer was $20.75 million with $11.25 million in debt that they needed to replace as well. So hypothetically, what we did was put them in a blend of eight DSTs with uh, different LTVs that matched their exact exchange requirements for the IRS. And they were very happy with us doing so. But we, we not only diversified them by commercial real estate sector, but by, by also LTVs in different amounts. And of course, all these DSTs hypothetically would be paying different amounts. And this couple was very happy with the, the end result here. And I'd like to, to leave, leave it with, again, you wanna have the right team in place. If you don't, you're really risking a taxable event. I would say probably three to four times a year, Keegan and I get a call and somebody's like, hey, I wanna do a 1031. And we're like, great. You know, we've got a bunch of DSTs for you to look at and ticks. And I, you know, we say, when are you selling your property? I closed last week. Great, who's your qualified intermediary? Oh, I don't know if I, I don't have one. Well, guess what? You're not exchanging. And it's a very uh, easily a avoidable very, issue. Yeah. yeah, it's so avoidable. Uh, and okay. so, yeah, we, we are here to educate. And um, as much as you need continuing education, uh, we're, we're here to be a resource. I think everyone here is. And uh, yeah, the key is getting in front of this uh, be, prior to your sale, as was mentioned before. Uh, connecting with as many people as possible so that you have, again, people working for you on the outside that are giving you options well in advance of your sale. Definitely. Well, we think I'm going to pass this back to uh, Carrie and un unshare my screen, but Thank I you. know I appreciate everybody on this panel today. And as I mentioned, everybody on this panel is very highly regarded. And Lynn is, I, I, don't even, I don't even think of another qualified intermediary when I think of sending somebody to a QI. She is, as Carrie mentioned, a wealth of knowledge and the best in the industry, as is Carrie, as is Michael, as is Keegan, and hopefully people think the same as me as well. But uh, anyway, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I will stop my share. Awesome. Thank you so much, Keegan and Wolfgang. Um, I, I know we're a little bit over time, but I'm happy to stay on if anyone has any questions at this point. I know that was a lot of information and um, all of these panelists are obviously experts and, and also educators, which I think 
is an important an important aspect of someone on your team. So any questions, please feel free. I can stay for a few if anybody has questions. You're welcome, Al. And if not today, then obviously um, all of us are open to chatting on the phone after whenever it works um, or you know, email, but. But yeah, so, all right. Well, it looks like everyone got all the information they needed, wow. Amazing. That means everyone did a great job. And um, yeah, thank you all so much for your time. This was so informative, so valuable, and I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. For oh, somebody you. said their audio is not working in the chat. They haven't, my oh. audio isn't working. This is Matthew Robinson. Audio isn't working at a question on single family primary residence. Go ahead. Um, yeah, you can put it in the chat or, okay. Yeah, it's, it's saying you're unmuted. But you can put it in the chat if you have a question. Single family primary residence. So would that be something? I think probably achieve? Lynn. Lynn, you're probably the best or, person to, to talk Michael, about that. Or Michael, if it's primary. Michael, yeah. Matthew, Matthew, you can just answer. You can type yeah. in the answer. Are you living in the property now? Have you lived there 24 months out of 60? Are you looking to take the primary residence exclusion? Oh, his audio is not working. Oh, yeah. that's what it is. I think all the uh, guests, it looks like they're all muted. They might be muted. Yeah, Matthew he says he can't hear. Um, no, he can't hear not. us? No, he can't hear. No, I think he can't working. speak. Yeah, I think we're not hearing him. Um, but yeah, I think realistically, the best thing would be um, after this, obviously, we'll have everyone's information and um, we can follow up with him on that question. Yeah.